we live in politically, you know, polarized times. Uh, and that's why any judgment that happens, any action that's taken, it's but natural. If something goes against someone who's, you know, a right winger or what ex-government does, a certain set of people say this is great, this should happen. Another set of people criticize it. If it was to happen to somebody from the opposite political persuasion, then it would be reversed. Some people say this is great and some people will say this is bad. Um, in this sort of an environment, perhaps it's only the judiciary that can actually perform the job of saying we're not going to be guided by what political views are by, or by what social media is saying. We should be governed by the law of the land and we should be governed by the constitution and we should be protecting people's individual liberties. Would that be a fair way of summarizing the situation? Absolutely. You know, every judge takes an oath to uphold the constitution and the laws. I've said this many times earlier also. You could be belonging to any religion. You could be have staunch religious beliefs. You could have, uh, you could be an atheist. You could have staunch political beliefs also. We have had some very good judges like Justice Krishna here who were uh, very aligned politically. But once they become judges, I'm not saying that they, that they totally lose their political identity. But they can, they can be independent and honest and true to the constitution. So if we just remember our oath that we have to be uphold the constitution and the laws, it is not very difficult. Our only Gita, our only Bible, our only Quran, our only Guru Granth Sahib is the constitution of India and nothing else. And if we are to maintain or in fact enhance, I think the time has come when we must enhance the image of the judiciary, then that can only be done if the judges set an example of not being linked to any political, religious, or any organization, and they're only pro-constitution and nothing, and not pro, they're not viewed as any pro-anybody pro except pro-constitution. So if you look at the situation, the way it's actually panning out, you, know, you will have, and this is the danger, I think this is the danger that you also highlighted uh, you know, many times, many other judges have as well. If you have a situation where X government and X government feels that because the process is often the punishment, you could file a case, you could file an FIR, you could arrest somebody, you could take away somebody's liberty. All of these are things that can be done. And a government, X affiliation or Y affiliation can do something against somebody they don't like. And the same can be reverted, can be done and is being done by governments on the other side. Right? That's the actual situation. What's actually happening on the ground is people are being arrested, people are going in for a long time, bail is not often given, cases linger on for years. What does an individual do in this situation? Because, as I said, whatever is being done to XYZ person will be cheered on by half the political spectrum and only opposed by the other half. Vikram, uh, I totally agree with you that, uh, you know, Actually, it's not only in political cases, even in any ordinary case, when a judge decides a case, there is one side who is not happy with the judge. But what is happening of late now is that whenever these are high profile cases have political or other ramifications, then as soon as the judge decides a case, then motives are attributed or something is dug up from the past of the judge to sort of innuendo or directly sometimes that this man, this judge is dishonest or corrupt or something of that sort. You see, this let's talk facts now. A bench of Justice Surakant and Justice Pardibala, both very good judges, delivered a judgment in the Maharashtra Assembly case which suited a political side. Now the other group went on a big attack on Justice Surekant especially on the social media. Two days later, when in, in the Nupur Sharma case, he made some oral observations against Nupur Sharma. The very people who had attacked him earlier became his defenders and those who had eulogized him a couple of days back and sang themes of praise in his favor now became his biggest art, most uh, uh, biggest critic. This is where I feel the danger lies. If social media is going to, you know, direct how our judges behave, 
that is very dangerous. So Sorry. we had Jaisa Pratiwala and others coming out and saying that this has to be regulated. You can't, you can't be attacking judges in, in, in this manner. Uh, how can that also be done without, you know, in some way, because technically there's freedom of speech and, you know, as long as someone is not going into contempt, how do you regulate the fact that judges will get criticized? And you're right, the criticism will come from either side, yeah. depending on whom the judge, uh, judgment favors. See, uh, you know, Vikram, uh, I, maybe I'm a bit old-fashioned, I joined uh, practice, uh, I joined the legal profession in 1978, almost 44 years back. At that time also, judges used to, the cases used to be reported. And the norm was at that time that, that neither the names of the judges nor the no, names of the counsel were ever printed in the uh, newspapers. Hmm. You see, because that publicity seeking doesn't happen. But when PILs came and then this process started of naming not only the judges but naming the uh, people. See, what I what worries me is today a petition is filed. And even before the petition comes up before court, it is circulated amongst the newspapers or the social media that I filed the petition. And before the judges can say, uh, half the world has made up in mind without knowing the true facts as to whether the petition is, there's any basis in the petition or not. So we have to, you know, evolve some now new rules of reporting matters from the court. I'm a great defender of free speech and I don't want that any there should be any uh, curbs on the freedom of free speech. But uh, let me give you an example that when I sit as a when I used to sit as a judge, sometimes they would ask very tough questions from the side which was arguing the matter. But that didn't mean that I'm going to decide the matter against the party alone. You see, as judges, we are trained to question and sometimes question inquisitorially also, so that we play the devil's advocate at times to get out the best from the counsel. And once we play the devil's advocate and we are satisfied that yes, with the answers given by the counsel, we may decide in favor of that very counsel who we've been, you know, sort of heckling. Now, you know, when it is tweeted minute to minute, And I have faced this once in the Supreme Court when I had to ask some of the, and they were good reporters, that one of the two on the bench had said something. I said, this was said wrongly without realizing. Could you withdraw this? Could you not report it? One of them said, but I've already tweeted it. See, sometimes we make, say something. I'm not talking about these oral observations. We say something. And then we realize we've also a human being that, no, 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 this is not we went. We want to correct us. So I think maybe... Reporting the reporter, I'm not trying to in any way curtail the reporting, but they could repair, uh, report it after the case is over. You see, after the, the discussion is over. As far as oral remarks go, these have been my, made since I joined practice. It was that not that judges did not make remarks. We got the rough end of the stick many times from some very eminent judges who said, who sometimes criticized us for not having not prepared the cases, sometimes of having no knowledge of the law, and sometimes a little bit of praise, a, uh, a pat on the back, and sometimes comments would be made about our clients also, that your client is a crook or something. Now, these comments are never put in the order sheet. You know, today it said it's not said in the judgment, it's not said in the so it, Having said it, that, it, I feel, I personally feel, that in this time when uh, social media is becoming so virulent and, you know, maybe judges also have to be a little more circumspect before making remarks. So let me just ask you a leading question. I mean, sometimes we heard Justin Pazibala saying, you don't want judges to be thinking about what's happening on social media or what is being said, you know, in, in the press one way or the other. You have to be guided by what the law is. What is your own take on that? Is that happening at all or... Uh, and I'm not just talking about the Supreme Court. I'm talking about Supreme Court, High Court, you know, uh, agency. Uh, and all that. Uh, you know, 99% litigants, their battle ends with the district judiciary. And for me, they, are the, they should be the biggest upholders of human rights. More than the High Courts and the Supreme Court. Though the Supreme Court and the High Court have to leave the way. 
Uh, you see, there was a time, maybe 150 years back, when judges, some judges even did not read the newspapers to be uninfluenced. Now, in this time and day and age, it is not possible. We are trained not to be influenced by what is written in the media or circulated. But let's face it, we are also humans. We also have a favorite reporters, favorite channels, and you tend to believe in what has been said. We may not be so much influenced by the WhatsApp university, but when columns are written about cases in uh, subjudice matters, I don't think that any judge can say that he remains, he or she remains totally uninfluenced by that. And with regard to your question about uh, influence of the powers that be, I'll not use the word government, but I'll use the powers that be. Well, I can't say that it doesn't exist at all. I hope it is as less as possible. Uh, there is, you know, there are judges and judges. Some can be pressurized, some cannot be pressurized. But the, at the same time, Vikram, I must tell you that judges also have their honest beliefs. I may be termed as what is commonly in common parlance known as a liberal judge. There are other judges who are by training, by habit, by their legal perception, conservative judges. They are not, I may disagree with their orders, but I can't say that they are influenced by the government every time they pass a conservative order. So courts also see a swing. We've seen it in the US Supreme Court where yes. a judgment delivered 40 years back has been reversed. We've seen it in our court also, where I feel that spirit of human rights is not being what I would, to the extent, be, is not being protected to the, uh, to the extent that I would. I have said this repeatedly that the Supreme Court has two roles, the Supreme Court and the High Court. One is the adjudicator of disputes, and the other is a very important role of being the protector of the human rights of the citizens. And as far as the second is concerned, I think there is scope for improvement. I, I think you made a couple of really important points, and I just want to dwell into them in slightly greater detail. First of all, um, what you said about, you know, specifically the human rights aspect, because actually, if A government or B government, different political affiliations, if either of them is violating the individual rights or the civil liberties of individuals, it should be wrong. And you should not be saying, this is correct because I like this government, or this is correct yeah, because right. I like this government. Both of them are wrong. And ideally, it is the judiciary, not just the Supreme Court and the High Court, but specifically the magistrates, who are the people who can give remand, the people who can give bail, the people who can say, why should we send this person to judicial custody for seven days or 14 days? Why should we not give bail if, it's a, if there's no reason to arrest the person? Those are the people who should be the first bastion of civil liberties and individual rights. Why isn't that happening? Is it happening, first of all? And if not, why isn't it happening? Uh, first of all, let me say, uh, Vikram, that you hit the nail on the head. For me, the bastion for protection of the civil rights has to be the district judiciary. Guidelines can come from the Supreme Court or the High Court. See, I when I lecture sometimes in the judicial academies and talk to the magistrates, I many times tell them that you are the guardians of the civil liberties of the citizens, especially the right of liberty. That right of liberty, that fundamental right of liberty can be taken away by you under the due process of law in terms of Article 21 by passing an order under Section 167 of the CRPC or other connected laws of that nature. But before, you see, what has happened now, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but I find that it has become a mechanical the police comes with a uh, with a application that we want remand for a week or ten days. The magistrate says not ten days, but one day, two days, three days, and then he'll extend it or something. So they are not looking into the very important aspect that of this striking a balance between the human rights and the need of the police to investigate matters. In every case, an arrest is not needed. 
Do you think, let me just ask this to you directly, do you think that one of, that it is a really serious problem in the country right now that too many people are arrested, people who do not necessarily need to be arrested, bail not jail is not actually followed, people are not given bail whereas they should, and our jails are filled with under trials across the board. If you hear about the high profile cases, if you go away from the high profile cases, there are hundreds and thousands of people who are in prison who probably don't should not be in prison. They should have been given bail earlier. They should not be under trial spending one year, two years, three years in prison. Is this a ex- uh, really serious problem right now? And perhaps the most serious problem for us to address when it comes it, to... It, 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 it is an extremely serious problem. I have no hesitation in saying so that it is an extremely serious problem. Because we must realize the importance of the right of liberty of a citizen. No doubt if a citizen is alleged that he has committed a crime, there is still that old presumption that he is innocent until proved guilty, except in a few uh, cases, in a few types of cases. Now what is happening is, we say day, we see day in and day out, that people are arrested. They are put behind bars. And after a month or two months, even the police says that no cases may. I think two days back, I read a report from uh, UP that five, six people who had been charged with rioting immediately after the Nupur Sharma incident or something, they were beaten up in the jail. And then after three weeks or two weeks, they've been told that the the police says there's no case against them. Who is going to compensate them for the two weeks of their lives? And as you rightly said, we talk of high profile cases of Muhammad Zubair and Tista Silat Talbad and all. But look, that lady from Maharashtra who tweeted against uh, Sharad Pawar, that cartoonist from uh, West Bengal who made a cartoon of Mamta Bath. It is across the spectrum that the power is being misused. First of all, the police is to blame. They don't even look at the matter. Yesterday, there was that very unholy, I mean, of an arrest of a journalist. I don't want the journalist to be arrested. But the way and the manner in which police from two states and three police stations are fighting to take his custody speaks very poorly of the independence of the police of all the three places concerned. So then the only hope left is with the judiciary. And I think, you know, it's not that we have, uh, we don't have good judges at the trial level. I think we have very good judges, very committed judges also. But they are not being, you know, they are not being guided properly. Then, you know, they they are scared. I'm, I'm using the word scared purposely, not scared of the government or something. But they're scared of granting bail in many cases because allegations will be leveled against them. They're in the beginning of their careers. They've just spent two or three years as judges as magistrates of five years, and they're scared. And sometimes, which is, I think we should end. I've heard judges say this when I talk to them. Ki, sir, we to say that we have order pass kar di, aapko higher court se bail mil jai, we'll be very happy. You see, they, sometimes I have seen, I must also tell you, that I have seen some high courts on the administrative side. This has been my personal experience. Uh, not being happy with judges who grant bail regularly. I don't know why. See, look at the way the judges' training is going. That if you read a case a few days back of this in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had granted bail and directed the other side to reply within six weeks. I think that's a very simple order. I know how Supreme Court orders are uh, worded. And the magistrate either did not read the order or the police hoodwinked it, him, that which the magistrate should not have. He did not probably read the order and granted non-bailable warrants against a person to whom bail, to who had been granted bail by the highest court of the land. Now we have to need to take action against that judge also. Right. See, judges must be trained to protect the human rights of the system. So, I mean, I think the problem is crystal clear and the problem is made worse by the fact that it's such a long process, right? It's a long process to get things listed. High profile cases, you can get it listed before the High Court or the Supreme Court and other cases you can't. What's the solution to this, sir? 
is there a solution consequences for police officers or other agencies but sometimes even in the frs they pad the charges they add charges like conspiracy or something else which may not be be, be founded but they know that it's be tough to get bail once those charges are inside um, is the is the solution consequences for police officers and others who do this is the solution compensation of some sort or how do you compensate for liberty or is the solution that the supreme court and others have to just mandate this in some manner saying that this is the principles that have been laid down like bail not jail you have to implement it across the board and it's not okay it's not okay if you're misapplying it to uh, you know the the the, the actor in kit uh, kit chadale or if you're applying it to these or who are you applying it for you you should not be a, you should be following certain norms across the board and don't I leave it to discretion of politics in other words i would say that first of all is the training of the judges because you all judges are, are supposed to go and undergo undergo two years training after they are selected but uh, normally this training is never extends to two years or sometimes uh, it's a training and part job also during this course of training they must be you know you can't tell them how to decide every case that would be interfering in their uh, excess of in their discretion the magistrate must have the must be given the strength and told he is the last person he is the person to decide that whether bail should be granted or not but these are the principles namely if principles being that even if it is a non bailable offense but the offense is not very serious the principle being that if the accused is not a flight risk the principle being that if the accused has very uh, if there are very few chances of his you know tampering with the prosecution evidence then it's a case for bail yes i can understand that in cases of murder in cases of rape in cases of serious offenses against the country or even in serious of economic offenses bail may not be granted immediately and you may give the police some time 15 20 days some uh, some police remand some judicial custody to investigate the matter but after that even in serious cases you know must consider whether bail should be granted or not even in the most serious cases even if we can't grant if we are not to grant them bail then we must ensure that they get a speedy uh, speedy justice if we promise if we can't give them speedy justice then we must in fact we have a provision in the crpc that if he has uh, if a under trial has undergone half the term which he is the maximum sentence for him then he should be released on i mean we must be one of the few countries in the world which why can't we have very great restrictions why can't you have electronic handcuffing today there are enough means why can't you have so that he, we know where the uh, accused is going you can electronically handcuff him monitor where he is going where he is not going but he is free to do live his life he is, everybody you see compensation is another aspect but how do you compensate for the loss of reputation how do you compensate for the trauma that a person goes through while he or she is in jail how do you compensate this arabi now there is no case against him. yeah how do you compensate i mean just no amount of money there is no amount of money which can compensate so some and one more thing and one i have think the time has come that compensation should be laid down and heavy compensation laid down by the supreme court in cases where the police itself after two three months says there is nothing or where the court finds after a couple of months there is nothing that means you kept somebody behind bars for nothing i mean this ridiculous that in a democracy that should happen and i agree with you 100% that we only try talk about high profile cases but those poor litigants in the mufassal areas in the rural areas are at the mercy of the police they could be drop, arrested at a drop of a hat right justice gupta that was the one of the most articulate enunciations of the need to uphold civil liberties and human and individual rights and ever and it should be done 
without making it a political partisan matter because these are matters of justice and constitution. Thank you, sir, so much for speaking to us. I'm just going to get Ashish into the discussion now. Thank you Thank so you, much. Sir. Thank you for having me.